Here now is Faith to Live By with Pastor Barber. What joy it is to be a child of God. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 19, the Apostle Paul describes it this way, You are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. The male quartet comes to sing, Since Jesus came into my heart, expressing the joy of their hearts. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought Since Jesus came into my heart I have light in my soul for which long I have sought Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart Floods of joy o'er my soul like the sea billows roll Since Jesus came into my heart I have ceased from my wanderings and going astray Since Jesus came into my heart And my sins which were many are all washed away since Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into came into my heart, since Jesus came into came into my heart, floods of joy o'er my soul like the sea billows roll. Since Jesus came into my heart. The Bible has the answer. You have provided the questions and we search the scriptures, God's holy word, in order to find the answers. Question number one. Did Benjamin not take part in selling Joseph into slavery because he was too young? We go to Genesis chapter 37 in order to find the account of Joseph's dreams and the anger and the animosity which those stirred up in the hearts of Joseph's brothers, as well as that multicolored coat which Jacob, their, the father of all of them, 
gave particularly to Joseph and the favoritism, the partiality which is expressed for Joseph over all of the rest. As best as we understand, we are specifically told that Joseph was 17 years old, still a teenager when he had these dreams. We are not specifically told how old Benjamin was in relation to Joseph, but we suspect that Benjamin was likely about 10 years old at the point when Joseph was sold into slavery. Jacob also appears to be very partial to not only Joseph, but also to Benjamin among his sons, them, those two being the sons of his preferred wife, Rachel, and undoubtedly due to Benjamin's age, as well as to Jacob wanting to protect Benjamin, that he was still at home, that he was not off shepherding the flock of Jacob along with the older brothers, some of them being much older than Joseph and Benjamin, that Benjamin undoubtedly was still at home with dad and that he was not a part of things that took place there. The brothers are not named in the plot except Reuben. He is the one who is eager to save Joseph if he possibly can and is absolutely torn apart when he comes back to the pit which he, Joseph had been thrown into and he realizes he's not there. We do have Judah named. He is mentioned as the one who comes up with the idea, look, let's not shed his blood. Let's not kill our brother, but let's sell him into slavery and gain a little bit of money out of this deal. We also have later on when Joseph is a ruler in Egypt and his brothers come to buy food. It's interesting that Joseph takes Simeon and, and uh, jails or imprisons him and he sends the rest on their way. Was that a way of saying, uh, Joseph saying, look, I, I, uh, this brother was especially spiteful to me. We are left in the dark and so we, we must leave it at that point. But undoubtedly, Benjamin was not a part of it and his youth undoubtedly also was a key role in all of that. Question number two, will believers who don't believe in the rapture still be raptured? We need to be very careful in the answering of this question. We must be careful not to give the impression, not to teach that, look, we can believe whatever we want to believe and just go on our merry way. However, however, I know some believers who do not share my understanding of eschatology, that is, last things, as I read the Bible. Does that mean that I throw them aside and think that they are either fools or idiots or that they're stupid or that they're blind? By no means. There is a certain respect and dignity that we share in the body, even as we press our points and say, do you not see this? Do you not understand what I would seem to consider to be very obvious? And so there needs to be a certain charity in that. My response is, a little bit tongue-in-cheek, that yes, most certainly they will. I just hope that I'm close enough to see the surprise on their faces and that I'll have the privilege of being able to say to them, I told you so. However, on a more serious note, I want to take you to 1 John chapters 4 and 5, and I'll leave these two chapters for you to read and to ponder a little bit more. 1 John, the letter of 1 John, chapters 4 and 5, but let me just read a few verses. 1 John chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of Antichrist of which you have heard that it is coming and now is already in the world. Verse 15 of this same chapter. 
Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, the one verse says that he came in the flesh. Now John says, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. One more verse, chapter 5 and verse 1. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and whoever loves the Father loves the child born of him. Thank you for these questions. If you have a question, send it to us. We will do our best to get to your question as quickly as we are able. Our mailing address, Faith to Live By, Box 426, Winnipeg, Manitoba, R3C2H6. Jonathan Cavist sings, My Faith Has Found a Resting Place, and that is followed by Rick and Matt Bowring singing, Near the Cross. My faith has found a resting place, not in device nor creed. I trust the ever-living one, his wounds for me shall plead. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died, and that he died for sinful soul I come to him he'll never cast me out I need no other argument I need no other plea it is enough that Jesus died and that he died for Yeah. 
I would like to tell you about our brand new CD, Tears Are a Language, God Understands. Heidi Taves sings the titled track of this 14-song CD. We would love to put a copy into your hands and into your home, even as we have for so many others all across Canada. Faith to Live By resources are always free and postage paid, and we send them out simply upon your request, either by mail, by phone, by email. We are delighted to hear from you. Ask for your copy of Tears Are a Language God Understands when you contact us this week. Our mailing address, Faith to Live By, Box 426, Winnipeg, Manitoba, R3C, 2H6 or call us toll free 1-833-367-3852. Also our website faith to live by .ca, is a means of you also contacting us and making your request known. And now we have Heidi Taves to sing the title track Tears Are a Language God Understands. But go 
we have been making our way through the book, or rather the letter of Ephesians, the letter that Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus as well as to other believers to strengthen and to bless, to encourage, to instruct them about the true nature of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians, if you notice carefully, has two benedictions. One comes smack in the middle of the letter. The other comes at the conclusion. Let me read the second and the final one. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ with incorruptible love. That is likely the lesser well-known of the two. Perhaps the better known one is at the midpoint at the end of chapter 3. Now to him, Paul writes, who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Why do we have these two benedictions? Was Paul thinking of concluding the letter at this point and then sending it on its way? I believe that is not the case. You see, Ephesians divides very nicely into two portions, three chapters and three chapters, six chapters in total. The first three chapters, as Paul typically does in his letters and epistles, he lays a foundation, he lays the groundwork, he lays a theological base upon which to instruct in practical matters. So the first three chapters, generally speaking, deal with theology. The second three chapters deal with very practical matters. Now, is there not practical stuff in the first three chapters? Indeed, there is. Is there not theology in the last three chapters? Most certainly there is. There is a very definite crossover, but the primary thrust is that Paul is first giving the background and he is giving the solid foundation upon which he builds, and then he moves forward as we hear in chapter 4, verse 1, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you, to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. Paul has been speaking to them about the call of God, how that God calls us out of death and out of darkness, out of the lifelessness of our spiritual grave, that he calls us to himself. And he tells us exactly how that was made possible that it was Christ coming into this world and dying upon Calvary's cross that he might call us to himself and cleanse us and adopt us and give us an inheritance in Christ, a wonderful consideration that we have been making our way through the past number of weeks. Now Paul is moving forward, but before he moves forward, having been overwhelmed with what he has just shared with the Ephesians and others, overwhelmed with all of this rich truth, the goodness of God, the mercy of God, the loving kindness of God. I believe Paul just erupted, whether he planned it or not, he just erupted into this blessing, in this benediction before he moved on to these other matters. And he says this, now to him, to Jesus Christ, to the one who came and gave his life that we might know life. Now to him who is able, not only able to go to Calvary, but the one who is able to work in us all that is pleasing in his sight, who is able to do not just sufficiently enough, just not the bare, mac, bare minimum, the one who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think. I would want to so bury that in your heart today. When you come to the Lord and you ask largely of him, you should never consider that you are spending God's resources and that there's not going to be anything left that you should ask in a small manner, 
I bid you to ask largely of God, believing and knowing confidently that there is no way that you can spend his storehouse of riches and of blessing and of strength. To him who is able to do far more abundantly, our imaginations are pathetic when it comes to what God is able to do. Far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according not to our power, but according to the power that works within us. Not our power, but the power of God that comes and changes us from the inside out where we could never touch and where we could never bring about one iota of change. And Paul says, to him be the glory, all the glory, every last speck and bit of it, to him be the glory in the church. Paul has been talking about the body of Christ, the church of the living God, the gathering together of God's people. And Paul says, to him, not to anyone else, not to the apostles, not to the prophets, not to the deacons, not to anyone, none else. To him be the glory in the church. That's something that we should be praying for today, all the time. Oh God, may you be exalted May you be lifted up. May you be praised. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. And he says, Amen. And I believe you would want to add that too. To God be the glory, great things he has done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son. And so let us praise him evermore. There's There's room at the cross for you. Thank you for joining Pastor Barbara today. Please watch for Faith to Live By again next Sunday at this same time on this same station. Until then, Faith to Live By prays that the peace of God will fill your heart and that the joy of the Lord will be your strength. Pastor Barbara would love to hear from you. The mailing address is Faith to Live By, Box 426, Winnipeg, Manitoba, R3C2H6. 